So you want to be a real estate investor, but where do you start? How do you know what information and sources to trust? That's where I come in. I'm Johnny Catani, and this is the Investor Relations Real Estate Podcast. Hey guys, real quick, before we start, go to investwithkatani.com and download my free ebook, Is Commercial Real Estate Recession Proof? Now to today's show. What's up guys and welcome to another episode of the Investor Relations Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Johnny Catani, and today's guest doesn't really need an introduction unless you live under a rock. It's Mr. Adam Adams. After selling his first podcast and seeing everything that his show did for his business, Adam founded a company to serve podcasters in a whole new way. Knowing successful business owners have already learned to stay in their lane and focus on revenue generating activities, Adam founded Grow Your Show, which is the easy button for podcasters. They make having a top rated podcast as easy as pressing record. Adam, welcome to the show. I'm excited to be here. Uh, we The intro doesn't really allude to it, but you actually started as a real estate investor syndicator and uh, have since ventured from that, but let's start there. What, what led to that? Well, let, let me, uh, let me correct you. I haven't ventured from it. Um, I'm adding two. there's always been two things ever since 2005, I've been a business owner and a real estate investor. So I started investing in real estate while I was in college, 2005. And um, also started a business back then as well. It was like a handyman company and, and I did property management and stuff like that. Um, so I helped people fix their places and rent their places. So I, we, we managed a whole bunch of other people's uh, portfolio or, or a couple people's portfolios and had a really good time, have repositioned a bunch of uh, different things, bought my first uh, multifamily in 2008 after selling uh, after selling a piece of land and I had a decent amount of money so, with it. So I was like, all right, I'm getting, I'm going to start owning my own because I, I had been managing other people's properties. So I said, I'll, I'll start owning my own, but I've always been a business owner and a real estate investor ever since 2005. Um, and right now I, I still have 300 and something units, um, that I own and, uh, actually just maybe two weeks ago, I closed on another small portfolio um, where I purchased out, bought out my um, my partner. So I'm still doing real estate. I'll always do real estate. I'm a passive investor in a couple of, of deals. And that's actually my favorite way to do it. Um, uh, but I had started a podcast back several years ago, and I helped a lot of friends with their shows to be able to grow them and get them ranked and um, because of that, I decided to have a business that serves podcasters. So now we are, we have about 30, um, 30 staff, 30 employees in that company. And we serve, it's crazy. We only serve like 48 to 50, uh, clients right now with 30 staff, because it takes a lot of time and effort to make sure that people's podcasts are getting ranked, but you cannot take me away from the real estate game. I grew up with it. My, my stepdad, we still, we still have self-storage units in the family. We still have, he's got multifamilies, uh, land all over the place. Um, so th- you can't take me away from real estate. That's for sure. Awesome. I love that. That's good to know. Um, you, <clears throat> one thing you did was you sold your show, which we talked about in the intro. Um, you obviously started it back before were podcasts just taking off or were you kind of even pre podcast being like the cool thing? No, I would say it was after it was, um, I had bought a, my first iPhone, uh, you know, back in 2014 or 15. And I loved podcasts. I wanted to start. I was like, I want to be a podcaster. This is, this is cool stuff. You're helping a lot of people. Um, it grows your business, grows your recognition, your brand helps you to do more business, helps you to learn more about your craft. I'm like, I want to have a podcast. So in 2016, I, um, there was two things that I started in 2016 after having an iPhone for maybe like a year or so I started a meetup group 
in Denver, ended up becoming the most active meetup group in the, in the state of Colorado, which is really awesome. And I started doing a podcast. We didn't launch until 2017 for the podcast. We wanted to have some uh, episodes in the bank. I think that's a smart way to launch. Um, but I, when I, after starting the podcast and seeing what it did for my business, as I think you said in the intro as well, I was like, man, I, I really want to help more people do this. Like this is, this helps you in so many ways. Um, so anyway. Awesome. I love that. And, um, you know, we, we spoke off camera, you and I spoke about potentially, uh, being a producer of my show, um, obviously love what you guys are doing. Um, shout out to my producer, April. <laughs> um, but kind of talk about what you obviously said, it takes a big team to do this. Uh, one thing that I really love about your guys' structure is how you can kind of choose your tier. And essentially, you guys guarantee a certain you know, ranking essentially. So kind of talk about, was that your plan all along or did you kind of realize that you had that opportunity as you grew your team? We had helped so many different friends and family um, through the years. My, my cousin just launched her podcast. She's a doctor in some neuro something science. I'm not even sure, but she just started her podcast. I'm helping my uncle start his podcast and uh, we've we've done this with a few people and they ended up getting ranked in the top 1%. And it took us a long time to see what we're doing that is actually affecting the rankings and getting Apple. When you're ranked that high, Apple promotes you. So it's like, what do we need to do to trigger the algorithms to allow Apple to do it? And I'll, I'll give you guys the secret sauce right here, right now. If you're going to start a podcast. Um, here's the five things that you need to do in order to make sure you're getting ranked. And the first one is to get people to follow your show. That is human beings following the show. Second one is to get them to download the episodes. This is not robot downloads, fictitious, like, uh, automated downloads it from some computer program, because when you do that, it works against you in the algorithms and actually you get shadow banned. People won't be able to find you. And so people are like, I want a high download number. So I'm just going to pay for downloads, fake ones. But if you didn't do number one already and three, which I'm about to share, if these people that download are not your actual followers, your subscribers, and it's just getting downloaded by random uh, robots or whatever, it works against you. And, and then the third one is that we need to get them to listen. Once they download, we need to get that person to actually listen, to play the episode. And we want, to, we want them to play as much of the episode as possible. So there's a lot of things you can do to make sure that they play the episode. I always say for number three, a hook story offer. Start off in the beginning of an episode telling your listener, what are they going to learn today? Then the story by giving them what they're going to learn. And then the offer is to give them some type of call to action. Now that you've learned how to start a podcast, I challenge you to, um, to go and buy your first microphone, you know, some type of offer, some type of call to action. Now that you've learned how to passively invest in real estate today, I want to challenge you to, um, to go and get a CRM that you can, that you can use or, or go and call three uh, three people to, and vet them on if they're the right operator for you. Well, give, a, give a call to action at the end of all of your episodes. So that would be the number three is get them to listen, to actually play the episode. You want them to play as much of an episode as possible and as many episodes in a row as possible. If, the, if they're binge listening, for example, that's a good thing. That works for you in the algorithms. If they're, if they're just downloads, but the person isn't listening, it works against you in the algorithms. The fourth one is to ratings and reviews. And this is argument to arguable because a lot of people will say uh, ratings and reviews do nothing. There's no uh, proof that they have any part of the algorithm. Um, I will just say that with our clients, they get more ratings and reviews than normal. We do. We help people get um, get ranked. And so they get more ratings and reviews than most people. 
and they're doing well. So that's part of the evidence to say that it might be in the algorithm. But even if it's not part of the algorithm, the social proofing is critically important. Uh, just the reason why we love watching uh, using Amazon to buy things. It's yeah, we use sure we can buy stuff in our underwear. That's great. Sure, we don't have to drive anywhere. That's also great. But what's best is that we see the social proof. We can immediately see how many people bought this product. Uh, do they rate it five stars, four stars? Do they say it's comfortable? Do they say that the batteries last? What do what do they say? And uh, so those ratings and reviews, even if they didn't do something with the algorithm, it allows for other people that come across your podcast to decide, oh, wow, this guy's got lots of ratings and reviews. Lots of people like this. I should like it too, because we're like lemmings. When, we, when one, of, one lemming jumps off a cliff, they all jump off the cliff. It doesn't even matter if it's, if, if it's safe or not. We do what we see other people doing. We, we, like to, we like to follow most of us. A significant portion of, of us like to follow the crowd to make sure we're into something safe. Now, there are also pioneers that would still listen, even with no ratings and reviews. But most of us as humans, we're like lemmings. We want to do what we see other people doing. That makes us feel more comfortable. And the fifth thing out of the triggering the algorithm to grow your podcast rankings is to get those people to come back. Now they've they've rated and reviewed, and we want them to we they, we want them to listen to the next episode next week when it comes out. We want them in a month from now to still be in a subscriber and still love the podcast. When we trigger all five of these you're going to get ranked. And so we, we do that in different ways with marketing, with private messaging individuals, how we ask them questions like, here's that, here's we, we in a private message for our clients, we'll say something like, here's that episode you asked for, let me know what you think of it. Just by having that one question uh, makes it so that they're actually going to listen to it so that we're getting number three, the, they're listening. And if they say that they loved it, then we say, we loved what you just said. I think you should copy and paste that as a written review for Jonathan, right? Now that you've said these beautiful words, don't waste them. I bet Jonathan would be love it if you would rate and review his show. Um, that was well said. And so now we're getting more people rating and reviewing. And then we just keep touching base with them after two weeks, after three months, we come back and say, oh my gosh, did you hear Jonathan's last episode? That was so good, right? And you, you're going to have lots of episodes. You're doing daily, aren't you? Daily. That's right. Wow. Five days a week. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I'm excited. Um, Fridays won't be a guest. Friday will be just me. Friday follow-up. I love it. That's a, um, good, that's a good plan. Smart. Yeah, it's good. Like review the week, what I've learned. Um, by the way, thank you so much for sharing those, those five tips. Um, I've definitely, uh, after our first meeting, passed along some info that you shared as well. So I'm grateful that you're willing to share all of this. Um, but yeah, so Fridays will just be me, um, kind of, you know, either what I learned from the week or what I'm working on in the business. So it'll be fun. I'm excited. Um, it's been a lot of fun. I've learned so much, you know, I'm doing like seven episodes a week or a day, sorry. Wow. And uh, learning a ton. So my knowledge in just the last two weeks is just phew, exponential. I love it. I at love least it. talk the talk now. <laughs> yeah. Well, make sure you implement the knowledge. And Absolutely. anyone listening after this, when you learn how to fly, when we're, uh, you, you don't walk home, fly home. <laughs> I love that. That's so true. Yes. Anyone listening, if you wanted to start a podcast as well, um, Adam is a great, great resource. They, you offer consulting as well, right? Even if it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't production. So yeah, we do. Awesome. Love that. Thank you. Uh, let's kind of jump a little bit more into real estate though. Obviously you've been doing it for, been around it for forever. What are kind of some of your investment thesis, you know, that you've had, and then especially in today's marketplace? Well, today's marketplace, uh, as we record, I believe that we have at least two strong years ahead of us because of supply and demand. Um, but I don't know how many years we have ahead of us. And so 
I'm slowing down on my purchases just for right now. Cause most of the time we hold for five to 10 years, that's our normal hold time. And so I just want to see what happens. So part of my thesis is that the market needs to have a tailwind, not a headwind. Um, and so we can do things if, if there's no wind at all, we can still do things. That's fine. However, if the market has a headwind and we're giving uh, 500 miles per hour effort and we have a 200 mile per hour headwind coming at us, well, we're, we're not going to be traveling as fast. We're going to be doing 500 effort, but we're going to be only going 300 uh, miles per hour, right? And so the, if you're in a market that, and when I say a market, I mean a sub market, not necessarily the global economy. I just mean in, uh, in this city, there's, they're bringing in jobs, the schools are good, that kind of stuff. Um, this looks like it's got a tailwind, not a headwind. In this other market, it looks like they've, they're, um, they've had a long expansion phase. They have tons of, em tons of empty units and they're already still building more uh, apartments in this, uh, in this location. Um, that was Tulsa two years ago. Uh, Tulsa was overbuilt and, um, and on top of just being overbuilt, they were still building. And so like with uh, average back then, this was a couple of years ago, um, 2019 actually, like three years ago, um, they had 85% occupants rate, occupancy rate, a 15% uh, vacancy rate, and they were building a ton more properties. They were being built at the time. And so that it would, it would have been an obvious uh, no in 2018, 2019. You could see that you don't want to invest in Tulsa. But at the same time, um, OKC, Oklahoma City, not far, just a couple hours away, um, they, they had an occupancy rate of 95%. And they were bringing in more jobs and not building enough buildings yet. And so that would, that would mean that in this market, I have a tailwind. Uh, and so I'll have 200 miles per hour helping me. So I will do my 500 miles per hour effort, but I will be going 700 miles per hour. It's a huge difference between the 300 to the 700 uh, when you have a headwind or a tailwind. So that's big part of my philosophy is like looking for places that have those types of metrics and specific tangibles that I think the listener can have, whether they're running the show or being a passive investor, like my favorite thing, um, it, it's, it doesn't matter if they're, if they're jumping in and they want to, they want to have a good market. Um, the things that they could look at are crime rate. Yes. Look at it, check it out, but don't put too much emphasis on crime rate alone. Because if the, if the crime rate changes overnight, something miraculous, and all of a sudden there's almost no crime, one of two things may have happened. They stopped caring about what happens. That might be one. Or number two, the, the governor just said, hey, we need to let people out of jail so that I look good so that I can get reelected. And so crime rate net is never the main thing that you want to look at, although it can be important. What is more important is the schools that you have. And so a, a criteria that my company, when we go in and purchase, a big criteria that we started looking at after buying a few deals and making mistakes, first, I, I better say that first and foremost, <laughs> um, is that we look to schools that are at minimum, all of the schools in that area, like the elementary that would go at a building that we're purchasing, or whether it's a home or a, an apartment building, all of the, the elementary schools are rated a seven out of 10 or higher. All of the middle schools or junior highs are also rated a seven out of 10 or higher and all of the high schools. If there's a six out of 10 and an eight out of 10, we're, we're not going to go there anymore. It's only seven out of 10 across the board. Now, sometimes we'll buy a 10 out of a 10 or a nine out of a 10, we'll get lucky. And the minimum is still seven out of 10. But we've noticed when we are focused on education, when education is a big thing, crime, going back to the crime, 
crime diminishes, crime slows down. You, when, when you have a better educational system, the, you have less crime. And so as a good factor to make sure that you're in a place that's going to have more longevity, look at the schools and make sure they're all seven out of 10. Now, when I say seven out of 10, you'll, you might notice that when I look up a school in my area, they're rated out of five, not out of 10. Sometimes they, they do it out of five. And so you, you want to be able to get something that's no less than a three and a half out of five. Same, th same difference. It still equates to seven out of 10. If you do the math, um, Another a couple things are job growth, job diversity, uh, population growth. W when we look at population growth, here's a metric that the listener, whether uh, an active investor or a passive investor like me, uh, wants to look for, is that the area should be growing 1% year over year. That's the population growth. It should be growing 1% year over year. If you find a place that is shrinking, stay far, far away. What's shrinking as we record? Um, let's see. Uh, a lot of the Northeast, North uh, New York, uh, um, Massachusetts, um, Connecticut, uh, California, even. Uh, these are shrinking. It means it probably not where you want to put your money today if, if they're shrinking. You, and if they went from, if they grew 5% last year, but nothing the year before, nothing the year before. That's not 1% year over year. That doesn't count anymore. We, if they grow 5%, 5%, 5%, that's a good thing. But we don't want to be looking for it. It, it stays stagnant for two years. And then last year they had a big pop. There's no way of saying that they're going to keep doing that. So the metric you look for is that three years running, 1% growth year over year. That's for population growth. Uh, job growth, a uh, really good metric to see is 2% year over year for the last two years. And um, job diversification, it's a little harder to uh, explain quickly on a podcast without like diagrams and things like that. But what I will share on job diversification is making sure that no industry, not uh, employer, no industry, has more than 20% of the job population. That's hard to do, by the way. Yeah, we've, we've, we've pushed up to 25% in an industry in some places where it's like oil and gas, but some of it is fracking. Some of it is, um, is you know, gas stations. Some of it is, um, is uh, uh, what is it? What are the refineries? refineries. And some of the, you know, when, when all of those things, but they all, but they still seem like fairly different. We'll, we might go up to 25% in a place like that, but you, you probably don't want to look for something that um, 20, 20% or 25% or more is all just government jobs. You know, you don't, that's not what you're looking for. Government jobs are usually pretty stable, but they can also close down and move to another city like that. And, and so you don't want anything more than 20 to 25%. So job diversification, the way I look at it is making sure that there's different levels, you know, different high paying jobs, low paying jobs, mid paying jobs, serving, bartending, um, construction, um, car, uh, auto mechanics, um, auto sales, oil and gas, government, uh, tech, and just like engineering and just keep naming because we want that to be as diversified as, as possible. So as you look um, at diversification, job diversification, you want to try to find a place that has uh, the whole gambit, the, the whole, um, if, if we're thinking colors, let's say the whole rainbow, the uh, little bit of everything, right? Wow. Um, some people are trying to go in just the tech places. Now, techs are boom and bust. You know, one out of 10 companies becomes multi-billion dollar, multi -billion dollar company. But, you know, maybe eight or nine out of 10 of them, they fail. And it's right. just, it makes it challenging. So job diversification. And then another metric that could help when uh, analyzing markets to invest in Um 
I, I might have lost my train of thought. So I'm sure it'll come back to me. I'll pause and let you ask questions. <laughs> no, those a lot of really, really great nuggets there. Um, job diversification is not one that I've heard too many people really focus on, but that's a great point. And you kind of touched on tech, especially now with COVID and post-COVID, tech is really fully remote. So, you know, for the most part. So, you know, just because there's a high tech, in one place, like look at, you know, Silicon Valley, like all those people have moved and they still work for companies based out of there. So that's one of those ones where if it's dominated, it could work against you. Um, So as a passive investor, you know, you said that's your favorite thing. It sounds like market comes first. And then do you go and, and start trying to find the top sponsors in those markets? Absolutely. Uh, I will mention the one that I remembered is average income. If you do look for the median income and uh, median median home prices, um, those are going to be good metrics for you. And here's here's the things that I've learned over over time is you don't want the median income to be too far above what um, 33% of your, or, or I guess, three times, three X, um, what it costs to stay at your place or 33%. I I might be going backwards, but the point would be if people, if people are coming into your apartment building or into the apartment building of the operators that you're investing with, and they make, um, six times the rent, that's actually not a good thing. Like, it sounds like a perfect thing. Oh, well, if 33% is the standard and these guys are doubling it, that means I'm even more safe that they're going to pay my rent. That's what we would uh, presume. But the interesting thing is that just means that they probably won't stay for more than a year. And you have one, as soon as someone moves out of your apartment community or your home, uh, your rental, whatever, as soon as somebody moves out, you got to fix that whole dang thing up. You got to redo the carpet in most cases. You got to repaint in most cases. Um, you might have to fix some stoves and refrigerators and uh, different things. Um, there might be mold from humidity or something. You're going to spend quite a bit of money turning over a property. And so, if you've got to turn over a property once a year, well, first and foremost, your property management companies, when they place a tenant, they're going to take a half a month's rent or a full month's rent. The day that they turn them over, the day that they place them, they're taking that first month's rent. So if you have to pay, for for example, uh, let's just say your rent is uh, 1500 bucks and um, then they're gonna take that first 1500. So you've already lost like 10-ish percent of your income for the year. And then if they get move out at the end of the year, and you have to spend, let's say, $5,000 to redo the place and get it ready for the next tenant, uh, the next resident, if you will, then you've lost half of your year. So you can no longer claim all of that income. So you don't want people moving in and out. You don't want move-in fees because you're paying your property management company. You don't want move-outs because you're paying your contractor. So anyway, just uh, remember that the average income should be right at that where 33% of the average income, the median income in the area is going to be about your rent price. Because if it's too high high up, they're going to go and buy a house right away. Anyway, um, so you you started to ask a question and I wanted to finish on that thought. No, I love that. Those were were really great points and not you don't, not a lot of people talk about, especially that last one with, you know, if they make too much, they're not going to stick around very long. But the question was, obviously you're very big on, on um, your market analysis. Is that your first step? And then you go find the top sponsors in those markets. Yeah, that perfect question. Step one is always going to be decide where you're, you're comfortable to invest. So you want to, you want to pull, pull a few things, find out what top markets are, and then you analyze some of the data on, your, on yourself. You look in, into some details and figure out where do I want to be in all of these places. Maybe you want to be somewhere where you visit. Maybe you want to be somewhere that's warm. Whatever it is, 
figure that out. And once you've done that, you go to your second step. And that's to understand who you're going to partner with in that area. So you, you came across DFW, Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas. And you said, I like that market. The cost of living is still pretty good. They're bringing in lots of different jobs, job growth, population growth. There's a lot of great things. Now you need to find the people that are operating those deals so that you can passively invest alongside with them. And uh, when you do that, there's a few things that you want to check. You will always look to see what is the experience of the operator and their partners. You'll always check. It doesn't mean you won't invest with somebody if it's their very first deal. It doesn't mean that that's impossible. Someone's going to invest with them on their very first deal. But you want to at least know and, and acknowledge what you're getting into and how many deals they've done and what kind of projections they gave and what kind of uh, profits they were able to pay out. Um, if you get along with them, I had a person that was on my social media and I was just posting about my mountain biking. That's all I was doing. I, I mean, I'm not on social media, like talking about uh, in investments all the time, but I was able to just throw in uh, a few times that I went mountain biking that year. And this guy called me and he said, I want to invest with you because we are alike. None of the other op none of the other operators are mountain bikers, and I I like you. I resonate with you because we have something in common. I'm just going to put my money with you. That was how they determined uh, to work with me. So I would say find somebody that you resonate with. Here's the biggest uh, piece of advice that I want to to share on on um, vetting an operator. It's the it's just your feelings. It's just your gut feeling. There's this is the starting point. If you get a no, if you if you're if you're feeling a disconnect, a dissonance, like a, a not good feeling, there's usually let's call it four out of five times. There's usually a reason why you're getting that feeling. If you have a good feeling, a positive feeling, you really feel comfortable about this person. You've seen uh, some of their other things, that doesn't mean immediately vet, uh, immediately work with them. It just means that they've passed the sniff test and now you get to look into a little bit more detail. So you find out that you like the person. He's also a mountain biker, just like you. You find out that he's in the markets that you want. It's, uh, it's Jacksonville, Florida. And that's where you were like, oh, Jacksonville, that's a perfect place for me. And so are they. And so now you're going to uh, figure out how do I feel that I'm going to interview with this person. I'm going to ask them some questions, whatever questions, it, it basically doesn't really matter what the questions are, but you'll get the responses from them. And if they feel like they're, if it feels like they might be hiding something, if it feels like they might not be telling you something, if it feels like they're over exaggerating something, um, you'll feel that pretty much immediately. If you don't feel that, it just means now that you now you're going to start vetting them by calling other people that worked with them. This is the next uh, positive step. So, if um, if it's their first deal, like let's just say they've never even closed on uh, a syndication ever, well, that doesn't mean you don't work with them. You find out who their partners are, how many deals their partner has done. And then you call people that have worked with, but let's just say what Pamela, let's just say this girl's name, this woman's name is Pamela and it's her first deal, but she's working with Jonathan who's done so many deals. Well, now I'm going to vet Pamela by doing, by finding out who's, who's worked with her before. So she hasn't done a syndication. Let's get character reference. Let's find out, um, uh, who, who she's worked for at, at a job. Let's find out how she did at that job. And you literally vet her based on that. And then you got to call Jonathan's people. Who's worked with Jonathan? Who's, who's, been, um, who's, who's invested with him on a single family or a multifamily in the past? And you'll, you start to ask those, you start to ask, what was it like working with him? What, how was the communication breakdown? How was the how was the papers? Did they give you your K1s on time? Which if you haven't heard of that, which maybe one listener hasn't, so we'll just share. That just basically means your pass through uh, earnings 
from uh, from those from the properties that they own. So did they give you your K-1s on time? Did they give it to you on March 14th or did they give it to you on January 12th? Well, if they gave it to you on January 12th, dude, Jonathan's epic. I want to work with somebody who's on top of things like that. Right. So no, no problem that this is Pamela's first deal. Her, her boss likes her, her mom likes her, but Jonathan, he gives his stuff on January 12th. I'm in. You know, so that's kind of how you would vet your operator. I love that. That's that's really, really great. And and I love that you touched on the first time because so many people are like, oh, first time, no, instant no. And, and that's fine if that's your criteria, but it's important to look at, okay, who are they working with? Like you mentioned, because listen, we all have a first time and typically it's going to be like our mom and our, our, our family who invest with us on our first time. But, you know, it's not crazy to go out and find, you know, even outside your, your close sphere, find money out there. As long as, you know, you have a partner that, you know, has that track record and, and can kind of vouch for you, which is why I am kind of sticking on the capital side because then I get to leverage, you know, these experienced operators. Yeah. A hundred, hundred percent. I, I really like that. And, you know, for people that are listening and they're wanting to invest with you and you're mostly partnering with other people. Yeah. I'm hoping that they'll vet you the ways that we talked and vet the operator, the ways that we talked, maybe they'll get on a call with them. Maybe they'll talk to some of their past investors. I think that's the easiest way to make sure you're investing with somebody who's going to do what they say they're going to do. Uh, unfortunately, like when I told you that my, my uh, podcasting company has about 30 employees. Well, we're hiring right now. And every time we hire, we call the FN references. Like people are, are like, oh, I'm just going to put uh, on these references and it won't matter. We call every reference. They say they got a degree at a certain place. We need to get the degree and look at the degree. Like we wow. vet. If they say they're, they're doing something, we verify it. And if we see any discrepancy, any incongruency, any dissonance, we're out. Sorry. Like you, all you had to do is just be straight up that this was your first deal. I would have invested with you. Right. But now you're trying to tell me that you've done seven and you haven't. I, I can't find any of the seven. None of these addresses exist. Uh, <laughs> none of these have your company's name on them. Right. I'm, I'm out, you know, yep. there's no reason to, to, to do that. So that's, that's how I am. I'm a, I'm a pretty black and white person when it comes to anything someone tells me, if it's slightly off, I'm like, eh, may as well just get out of this one. You know, I love that. And if anyone listening by the time this airs, if you're thinking about joining, grow your show, you heard it right here from the, from the big boss, do not fudge your, your resume. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there you go. Awesome. And uh, what was I going to say? Oh, go go ahead, go ahead. You had a you have your question, so that's perfect. No, we're we're getting up toward, towards the end, so I was just going to jump into the the final okay. five questions. So, what did you remember? What you wanted to say? Nope, I okay. remember the, to get into the final five. <laughs> All right, final five. <laughs> First question: Best advice you've gotten from a mentor? Oh, I love it. Okay, best advice I've ever gotten from a mentor. It, it, it's probably somewhere along the lines of your network is your net worth. Um, Trevor McGregor is a guy that I hired as a mentor for about six months. I think he still works with Joe Fairless, by the way. I think Joe still has been hiring him after like seven years in a row. Uh, but he was real focused on who's in your network and who you know and who you can be connected with. And that stuck with me. Uh, I mean, start a podcast, it grows your network, start um, a meetup, it grows your network, uh, connect with other people, go to other events, hand out your business card, follow up with people. Um, but that's really what I learned from Trevor is, is, is how important your network really is to your net worth. Awesome. I love that. It's so true. And the more you get into it, the more you realize how, how true that really is. What is it about your career that makes you feel like you're fulfilling your why? Um, I will say that my career is the podcasting company. Um, I, I've, I've always liked rentals and providing housing and doing a good job as well. But my main focus uh, right now is, is the podcasting company. And 
why do I feel like that fulfills what my purpose is? It's because we're doing something that not everyone can do. And I think that we're providing a service that there are some people that really need it and they can afford it and it helps them. It gets them to their, where they're going. It's the easy button for some podcasters and they're, they've got a guaranteed top 1% ranked show, which has way more listeners, way more ratings and reviews, way more social proofing, way more um, money that they're making at the end of the day through their companies because of that. And that, that, just makes me feel like when I, when we bring on a new client, I'm like, yes, we're helping another person to be able to fulfill what they're really looking for. Because here's the thing in brief people, when they start a podcast, there's one, there's only two reasons why you'd start a podcast. A, you want to leave a legacy. B, you want to, you want your business to be more successful. There's really no other reason. Like, yeah, you will learn something. But that's a secondary thing is right. the learning. So most people do it with the intention of I'm either going to make money or I'm going to make an impact, an income or an impact, right? And for, for us, if they have a listener base, a strong listener base, easily can make an impact, easily can make an income. Without the listener base, can't do either one. So um, it makes me feel really good to be able to offer a service like that. I love that. That's awesome. What is your favorite non-real estate or investment related book? <laughs> so many. I've been reading quite a bit of business books, but there's one that is off the, just off the beaten path that I doubt anyone else on your, uh, on your uh, podcast will mention. And it's called, it's called um, Beyond Religion by the Dalai Lama. Oh. It's so interesting to me because... I mean, we all are trying to be good people. We all make mistakes, but I think deep down, really, we want to be doing righteous things to other people. And it comes to the thought process of um, what is a uh, what is a moral, what is ethics? Because for the most part, in the past, we've always learned morality and ethics through religion. That's the main place that it's come because. We always use these stories from the Bible or Quran or whatever we read in order to teach these lessons of, you know, not killing, not hurting, not stealing, whatever it is to teach these lessons of your body is a temple, treat it right. Um, but it's been hard to figure out. And the world has been going pretty secular. I mean, in the past, it was like, probably 90% of people, maybe 100% of people were somehow religious. And now I feel like it's maybe 60% of people. Yeah. I mean, this is my perception. Right. And so we're, we're starting to lose in the world a little bit of the ethics and moral, morals. Mm -hmm. So Beyond Religion by the Dalai Lama is very interesting because it talks about how these morals are inside of us. And it really comes with compassion and caring about other humans. And it teaches you how to do this. And, and it's very interesting about morning routines and meditation. There's so many like secondary things that you learn through that book. Um, but for me personally, I was, I saw a lot of the stories that he shares and I'm like, man, I do that. And it's a bad thing, right? He's talking about a bad thing. And I'm like, I do that. How do I stop doing that? And then he teaches you how to do that. And I'm like, now the way that I get along with like, we'll just say my in-laws, for example, the way that I get along with my in-laws, every conversation starts from love. Yeah. Like instead of like the resentment that I probably used to have <laughs> and the ego that I probably still have, um, now I can at least approach it with love, kindness, care, like they're looking for the same things in life that I am and they didn't do anything wrong. And, and I t tend to treat my kids better, my employees better and my in-laws better as well. Wow. So it's a remarkable book. I mean, uh, there's a lot of reasons why I think people should check it out. I'm gonna put even if you're list. religious, even if it's still a great book. If you could have any superpower, what would it be? 
<laughs> uh, can going back in time be a superpower? Definitely time travel for sure. Hmm. Flying, uh, time travel. Someone told me underwriting once. <laughs> I love that. Um, I know, I loved it so much. If I could have a superpower, I think I think I would want to time travel. I love it. I think I could use that for for um, to do a lot of lot of good in the world. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, what's the best way for people to get a hold of you, learn more about the podcast production and everything else you offer? Three things, depending on what they want to do. They just want to connect and be my friend and mountain bike with me. Go to my Facebook, Adam AAA Adams. Um, they want to launch a podcast or grow a podcast. They can literally just go to growyourshow.com. That's the website and check it out. And then there's a button to schedule a call with me. And if they want to just list, they're not, uh, I'm not going to pay for anything and I'm not a mountain biker, but I am curious about what Adam does. They could just go to the podcast on podcasting. That's my current podcast. And it does teach podcasters how to, how to launch, grow, and monetize. So those are the three different things, depending on who it is. I love it. We will link it in the show notes. Adam, thank you so much. This has been amazing. I appreciate you coming on. Yeah, my pleasure. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching today's episode. I hope you really enjoyed it. Listen, I know it's cliche and you hear it all the time, but please don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel so you know when the next video is coming out. Even though this is technically a daily podcast, you know it's coming out the next day. Uh, we have a ton of content coming your way. So please like and subscribe. It helps a ton. Leave comments. We'd love to know what you guys think. And uh, we will see you on the next one. Thanks so much.